Welcome to day 12 of the 90 day novel challenge. My name is Brad Paquette. And today we're going to talk about the impossible thing some more. And I also want to have so I want to give you some notes for memoirs. So we are on day 12, which means that you have two working days left to get your plan in order and have a scene list so that at the beginning of next week, you are ready to start putting words on the page for your story. So that is super exciting. But what that means is that if you are still dawdling, if you're still kind of playing around with the plan, now is the time to kick it into gear. You know, you've got about two working hours left to finalize some pieces, get it all squared away so that come next week, you know what you're doing and you are ready to move forward. So if you're still there, change your mindset and kick it into gear so that you can reach that objective and move forward. So let's touch on this impossible thing just a little bit more. We've talked about the impossible thing on a couple of other days, um, but it, just to refresh our memories, it's the idea that by the end of the third act, your protagonist must do something that is impossible for him or was impossible for him at the beginning of the story. So the impossible thing that your protagonist does doesn't need to be generally impossible, like nobody could do it or hardly anybody could do it. It doesn't uh, need to be impossible for your reader. It simply needs to have been impossible for your protagonist at the beginning of the story. So a really simple example would be if your protagonist is established at the beginning of the story to have crippling social anxiety, then hosting a party at the end of the story could very well be an impossible thing. Feels simple, but as long as we've established that that wasn't possible for him in the beginning and we've we've had a compelling driving conflict that that takes us through the three acts to that final scene where he finally hosts a party, it could very well work. And a common question that I get is, do memoirs have to follow this novel matrix stuff? And the answer is yes. Uh, your memoir still has to follow this, this novel matrix stuff. It still requires the sensibilities of story structure and these kind of systems that we've been talking about in order to be a re relatable and digestible story for your reader. And your memoir does need to include an impossible thing. So if you're planning on telling a memoir, you need to look at your life through that lens and ask yourself, what impossible thing did I accomplish? And again, the impossible thing doesn't have to be outrageous. Like you don't have to be a gold medalist in the Olympics or have scaled the Eiffel Tower or something like that. But there has to be something that was seemingly impossible for you at some point in your life. And through a series of events, you grew as a person, you changed, and that impossible thing became possible. And even if the impossible thing really wouldn't wouldn't seem magnanimous or super impressive to us. Nonetheless, if you can sell that story, we will still relate to it, especially if you can frame it in terms of agency, because we can all relate to stories of agency where a character feels trapped, but then they choose to take initiative and be self-determining in their life and they accomplish something through that. So beyond your memoir, beyond your impossible thing, rather, your memoir needs to follow the other sensibilities of the novel matrix as well. Um, so we see a successful memoirist like Bill Bryson, who wrote, uh, I think, A Walk in the Woods. And we ask, we have to ask the question, like, does he just automatically always live perfect stories? Like his life just somehow falls into three act structures naturally, and he has the perfect number of friends and the right number of conflicts and it conflicts in his life? Well, of course not. You know, professional memoirists have learned to take the stuff of real life and while being authentic and honest to distill that information into a story that a reader can hear and relate to and understand. So the problem for most memoirists is that if we think about our life, you have seemingly an infinite number of conflicts, right? Um, you know, we could probably make a list even, and a lot of them are little or petty and some of them are big, doesn't matter, but you are just surrounded by all kinds of things that need to be fixed and worked out all the time. You're also surrounded by tons and tons of different characters. You know, we've made space for, for six secondary characters in this story. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know a few people really well, and then I know dozens moderately well, and probably, you know, a few hundred people, I, I would recognize them and, and I could do small talk, you know, if I saw them in the store. And so 
your challenge is to take all that stuff of real life and to reduce that into the novel matrix structures. And in that way, the novel matrix actually becomes your best friend. Because rather than having to look at this whole nebulous life of conflicts that you live in which, you know, you got to get the car fixed and you got to find a new person to cut your hair and the dog's nails need trimmed. And, you know, on and on and on we could go. Rather than having to take that whole nebulous life that you have that's kind of big and unquantifiable, we look at the novel matrix and you say, okay, I have room for three little world conflicts here. And so of all of that stuff that I could potentially ramble on and on about in this book, I need to pick three specific things that I'm going to talk about. And I need to identify those in my plan right now. And then same thing with two big world conflicts. And then here's the tricky part. Then as you're writing, you need to exercise the discipline to actually constrain yourself to those conflicts that you've identified. Sometimes there's like something else that happened that was really, really interesting, but it's not on target anymore for the story that you've decided to tell. And so you need to exercise the discipline to say, well, I guess that story is not for this book. Uh, how about I just be really make this book the best that it can be, be really successful with this one. And then maybe there's another story in which I can include that anecdote later on. And then you, you do the same thing with your characters. You know, of all of those people that you want to include in the story, it's too many. If you include how many years did it take you to get to know all of the people who have influenced your story? Many. Right. And your reader just doesn't have that time. They're going to spend six hours in this book. So you can't introduce them to everyone you've ever met. Instead, you get four, four good guys or four reasonably helpful guys that are going to be a part of your story. And so you got to pick and choose who's going to make the cut for this story. Um, whose influence am, am, am I going to emphasize or even magnify a little bit to make their role justified in the story? And by the same token, how am I going to pick two bad guys? Right. And so this is that that can be hard for memoirs as well. But we need people that stand in those roles. Remember our definition of conflict from the beginning, which is two things in tension. This is hard for memoirists when it comes to things like antagonists, because simply overcoming something, simply overcoming a challenge or obtaining a difficult objective often isn't enough to compel a reader to continue on in the story. It can't justify six hours of their time. So we need to figure out how your life turns into actual conflicts. And that includes things like antagonists. So the novel matrix is your friend that you can look at the infinite possibilities of your life and know that, you know, for fiction writers, it's the opposite. You see five holes and you're like, oh my gosh, I only know three things. How am I going to fill five here? And you got to come up with more memoirists face the opposite problem where you have a hundred things you'd like to include in this and you got to pick just five conflicts that you're going to focus on just four friends, you know, that are really going to be an integral part of this story. So we see that problem with the impossible thing. Often memoirists really need to pay special attention to that. Um, you are not exempt from having an impossible thing or from using these structures that we've discussed. The other ways I see this impossible thing misapplied is when the protagonist only makes a decision in the climax. So every year we write novels here as part of our full-time apprenticeship program in Cambridge, Ohio, which I would love for you to check out and see if it's a good fit for you. We have people come from all over the country to be a part of this, and, and we'd love to have a conversation with you if you're interested in it, but that's all on aside. So we write novels here every year and they have to use the plan. They do this. They walk through the same exact process that you're walking through, except of course, I'm giving them one-on-one -on -one counsel as they go along. And every year I get lots and lots of plans that end with a climax in which the protagonist decides to be the hero. They go through this three act structure and they have an experience and they grow as a person. And then the climax is the protagonist decides that they'll say yes to whatever the thing is. And so that's a natural instinct that we have when we're, when we're putting this, our story arc together is that that is, that is a climax. And I think we think that's a climax because it's often the most important part in our journey. 
right? Oftentimes after that in our, in our journey is actually kind of the boring part that the big deal was like, you felt like God was putting this on your heart. And then finally you decided to say yes. And man, that was the moment that things really began to happen. However, when we're telling a story in novel form, simply making a decision isn't enough. What we as the audience really want to know is, so what? So the hero decided to be the hero. Now, what did they do with that? And so there's a really simple solution for this, actually. If you found that in your climax, all that happens is the protagonist makes a decision. I simply want you to shrink your story structure back to the left so that your climax now becomes your Icarus moment. And your rock bottom moment can either be your present rock bottom moment or the epiphany can become the rock bottom moment. And now that in the Icarus moment, your protagonist has decided to take on the heroic quest or accept the mission or give love a try again, whatever they've decided to do in the Icarus moment, now you can show us, so what? And probably what's going to happen there is that the bad guys are not really going to care for that decision so much. And so they're going to start to put pressure on the protagonist. They're going to start to once again make the protagonist's life super miserable, drive them in that downward, that falling action sequence of the second act so that they're humbled, so that they can come to the epiphany moment where they'll learn a lesson. And now they've made a decision in the Icarus moment. They've learned a lesson or something's come together in the epiphany moment. And now they're going to use that decision that they made at the Icarus moment to do something that is truly compelling and heroic. You know, if they decided in the Icarus moment that they would give love a try again, this is the story. This is the the format of Hitch, actually, which is one of my favorite romantic comedies. So in Hitch, at the Icarus moment, um, Hitchens, who uh, Alex Hitchens, who is played by Will Smith, he basically decides that he's willing to open his heart to somebody again. And then he gets because of that decision, he gets crushed again and again and again. But then in the epiphany moment, he learns a lesson about what that means and how he's been preventing himself from pursuing love. And he decides then to pursue love heroically. So and uh, ultimately he he wins the girl, right? But it's it's that third act that is the payoff for the reader. The decision is important to you as the author. It's important to the protagonist, of course, but it's that payoff in the third act that we really need that makes the story something exceptional um, that we want to tell our friends about. So again, the solution is easy. If you found yourself in that position, just shift everything back to the left and then come up with a new downward story arc of the second act and a and then you ask yourself, OK, and now that they've decided to be the hero, what are they going to do with that decision? So throughout this, remember what a conflict is. A conflict is two things in tension. Challenges and obstacles aren't enough. Um, in order to be a conflict, there must be an opposition. So take these keys and run with them. I can't wait to see the work that you're going to produce. Um, you know, don't be nervous at this stage. I think as you're staring down the last two days, it would be natural to kind of start to feel some anxiety and pressure about the project. Remember that this is fun, right? That's why you're here. And there's something about this that when you're having fun, your readers can tell. And even if the story is is deadly serious, you can tell when the author is is enjoying and having a good time with what they're writing. Just like when you watch a movie, you can kind of tell if the actors are miserable or if they're having a good time producing this. And it doesn't matter if it's a comedy or a serious movie or whatever. There's a difference in the product uh, based on the attitude of the people going into it. So as you're looking at these last two days, remember that you got into this, I hope. Because at least a little bit, writing seemed like it would be fun. So it is important to get some stuff in those holes on your plan and move on toward that scene list. But the fate of the world does not hang in the balance of these decisions. If you're not sure, just put something down. Just get something in those blank spots. Even if you feel like there's no justification for it, you're just totally making it up as you go along. That's okay. Put it down. The plan is wet cement when we begin writing next week. So it can still shift. And while we, we do want to have a plan, 
so that we can always be evaluating our effort against the plan. And we have that confidence that we made a plan and it's a good plan and all those things that we've talked about that are really important. It is still wet cement. So if you feel like you get into this and you're writing and you're kind of discovering the character as you go through the first act and you kind of want to tweak that internal conflict a little bit, because as you're seeing the character, something else just makes sense. You're allowed to do that. I mean, that's a secret. Don't tell my apprentices that because I always tell them it has to be rock solid before they get started writing. But reality is you still have wiggle room after you get started on this. So don't stress out about it. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, it is time to shift gears. Like if you have just been kind of like playing around and kind of trying this and trying that, it is time to settle into something. It is time to just mark something down and put it in the box. But that doesn't mean that you have to rip the fun out of it. So your assignment is simple. Continue to work your plan. Continue to develop that scene list. As you go, go, continue to double check all of the elements. So is your impossible thing actually an impossible thing and not just a decision that somebody has made? Are your conflicts actually conflicts? They are two things in tension. You know, two ideas that you could defend if you needed to, on each side of the conflict. Um, and similarly, are your characters real people? Like we talked about yesterday, is there, a, is there an actual person of some kind, as creative as you want to be with that, but of some kind that is performing this function for the manuscript? So as you're moving forward, continue to just always be walking through, double checking those elements. And then as you develop your scene list, again, you're just double checking. Yep, these conflicts are adequately represented. And if that's good, don't sweat it. So don't take this too seriously. Continue to work your plan. Have a lot of fun with it. Invite God into that process. And honestly, what can go wrong? So until I see you tomorrow for our final planning day, happy writing and be blessed. Be blessed.